Come on, make some noise, Substance, wherever you are at. You made it to church. Happy Memorial Day weekend, man. It is so good to see all of you. And I, I, I'm, I'm so pumped that you're, you're all here today. And I, I, we're going to have extra, extra, extra fun. But before I, I, I get into the message today, I, I wanted to share two different exciting announcements. First off, many of you guys know that uh, here at Substance, we've been doing, uh, we just had our, our fast forward offering, our last one, our, our final fast forward offering. It's like a tongue twister, the final fast forward offering uh, this last weekend. And for those of you who are newer and you don't know what that is, uh, well, let's just say it this way. 18 months ago, we started a campaign called Fast Forward. And and the the goal with this campaign was to do just four offerings over 18 months to uh, save up, uh, to purchase and upgrade the historic Wesley building in downtown for our downtown campus. Come on, everybody in downtown. We love you. We love you, uh, but also to upgrade some of the basic things here at Northtown and, and eventually to save up for a, a new multi-site somewhere either on the east side of the Twin Cities or the west side of the Twin Cities. And of course, I, you know, we were hoping to even pull off Historic Wesley and do it with a, a 50% down payment. That means purchasing it and then uh, the, the money down to upgrade everything because I love to be conservative with cash. Uh, but in order to do that, we needed to raise or we needed to save two and a half million. Well, um, through old-fashioned penny-pinching, the staff and I ended up saving up about a million dollars over the last 18 months. And through our fast-forward offerings, you guys contributed, get this, $1.5 million, which means we did it. We did it. Come on. And I cannot be more proud of you guys. Air conditioning is coming to downtown. Some of you are like, oh, thank goodness. Uh, but and obviously, it'll still be a few more mo- uh, months before you guys see a lot of the changes that we've got planned. Uh, but you can be sure of this. The Twin Cities will never, never be the same. And of course, on a, on a side note, many of you guys also know that uh, we recently launched a nationwide outreach called Substance Variant. Uh, we launched uh, our congregational worship band, Substance Input Output, last fall. And, and this spring, we launched an outreach called Substance Variant. It's an all DJ led electronic dance music uh, worship experience. And of course, we recently hit number eight on the mainstream iTunes chart. And get this between all of our, our music projects from Substance Input Output to Substance since variant, we've had over 190 thousand downloads, views on YouTube, Spotify, social media. Come on, somebody! I love that. Uh, and, and that obviously had an impact on our fast forward campaign as well. But mark your calendars because get this, on June 13th coming up in just a couple weeks, we are actually going to be doing an official release performance of Substance Variant right here at our Northtown campus. And we're going to be sil- filming several music videos out of this. And keep in mind, a singular music video can get 100,000 downloads, okay? So uh, just, I, I want to encourage you, reserve your tickets for it as soon as possible because we're only doing one night. It's free tickets, but you got to reserve your spot uh, if you want to help us uh, make these music videos. And so again, if you like dance music or you just want to exercise for Jesus, come on, somebody. Some of you are like, I need to exercise, and I need to do that for Jesus. Um, no, seriously, part of the reason why we're doing it is because we're actually launching Substance Variant in the UK uh, to a festival of over 7,000 near London this August. And so uh, we're assembling these music videos just to continue uh, to push the message of Jesus into places where it has never been before. How many of you know that there's really very, very few churches that are growing and very few churches that are even having an impact on mainstream culture? And we really believe that God has given us the conviction and the purpose to be one of those churches. And so be praying about June 13th. And and let's thank God for all that he's doing. Could we do that just one more time? Thank you, God, for using us. Thank you for using our church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, today we're going to be taking communion here on Memorial Day weekend, and and yet uh, before we dive into God's Word, I want to make sure that this message is practical, okay? So before we we jump into God's Word, I want everybody to think about a long-term dream that you've had. And I don't know what that is. Maybe you have a dream of getting married. Maybe you have a dream of having a family. Maybe it's a, a dream job. Maybe it's a dream business, a dream ministry, whatever that is. I want you to get that dream at the forefront of your mind. 
okay? And it, because the passage we're about to study is really all about thinking straight when dreams are delayed. It's actually a message to God's people when they've been waiting on the fulfillment of a certain prophecy for many, many, many decades, okay? Uh, as an example of this, okay, just to kind of give you an example of a dream that has been fulfilled. My wife and I, uh, we, we've been in full-time ministry for a little over two decades, and, and of course, we've had all sorts of dreams about, uh, about full-time ministry vocationally and professionally, all these, you know, even even for our kids, these types of things, dreams for our family. And, and, and so Carolyn and I pastored a church in Wisconsin for about nine years before we moved here, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago to, to plant substance. And, and of course, uh, I've always been a very, very passionate musician. In fact, I never really thought I was going to be a pastor. I, I, my parents kind of raised me to uh, be a, a professional cellist in a symphony orchestra. And of course, I always played, I took private lessons in just about every instrument. And, uh, and, and partly why I moved to the church in Wisconsin is because they were nationally known for their worship stuff. And of course, I was going to be a worship pastor there. And, and of course, I'll, I, I never, I, I'll never forget, I just spent hours and hours and hours in the studio doing a new album. Uh, this is, I don't know, probably, it was about 16 years ago, I finished a major album project. And of course, you know, it, it, a lot of people don't realize how long it takes to do an album. I mean, it takes a minimum of 40 hours uh, of work per song uh, to do an album. And of course, you got to do way more songs than are actually on the album. And, and of course, I just finished this like two-year-long process of, of writing all the songs, recording it. Now I was, I, I was shopping it to record labels. And of course, you know, all of the, the industry insiders, they would always tell me the same thing. They, they would tell me, you know, Peter, this is an incredible album. I really believe it's great singing, great songwriting, but um, there's two problems with your, your overall business model that you need to really think through. Um, first off, Peter, you need to be in a church that's at least over 5,000 members in a major metropolitan area, preferably in the Bible Belt. And uh, that not up north, and uh, and secondary, and if you're not going to have that, then you got to choose the alternate route, which is this: you got to resign your senior pastorate, and you have to be willing to tour at least 200 days out of the year. And of course, you know, I remember when they would tell, they, it was like uniformly over and over and over again, they said the same thing. Like, I know you have this dream in your life, but listen, and, and you actually have the talent to do it, but listen, this dream is, is kind of ridiculous without these other circumstances. And we're just not, we can't invest in you unless you're going to do these things. And of course, um, you know, here's the deal. I'm not blaming any of these uh, record execs for even saying that because, uh, and yet the truth was at that time, God had not released me from that ministry. God had not released me from central Wisconsin. God had not released me from pastoring. And so really the, the net result of what they were saying was this, Peter, your dream is hopeless. I mean, they might as well have just said that. Peter, you, you're, you're like a person stranded on a desert island wanting a snow cone. It ain't gonna happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, and I don't know, I don't know if you've ever been there before. Maybe it'd be like, it'd be like telling a single person you're never gonna be married or telling a, a married couple you're never gonna have kids unless you clearly go outside of God's will somehow. And, and I, I don't know if you've ever felt hopeless before, but I, that's where I was at. I was just hopeless. And of course, in that season, the reason I'm sharing this story is because in that season, Season, God spoke to me through his word, and that's the very passage that I'm about to, to study with you today. And so if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. We're actually going to read through the entire chapter. And, and the reason why I'm even sharing this today is because this chapter of Scripture resurrected my heart in those seasons. And of course, you guys know how the rest of the story goes. I mean, you know that God eventually fulfilled that dream in my life, and it took a lot longer than I would have expected. And, and it took a lot more, uh, the delay was a lot longer, but guess what? It was better than I expected. And I want to resurrect your faith just by reading this chapter from Isaiah. And if you read the book of Isaiah, up until this point, it, it can be kind of a, a depressing book uh, up, up through chapter 39 because most of the chapters preceding chapter 40, it's God warning his people that, listen, you're going to reap what you sow if you do not obey God. And of course, God's people refused to obey God. They kept being complacent. They kept 
kept wanting to go outside of God's will. They didn't want to wait on God. They didn't want to do the things that God had asked them to do. They didn't want to be faithful in little things. And so I, God was using Isaiah. Listen, you got to be faithful. You got to be faithful. You can't, you can't get distracted. You can't turn to these other things, these alternate solutions. You got to focus on God. And yet they wouldn't do that. And they kept, they kept refusing to react to what Isaiah was saying. And of course, guess what happened? They reaped what they sowed. They got taken into uh, slavery by Babylon. And of course, you know, now they're in, in Babylon as slaves and, and everything, all of their worst imagination started happening because they disobeyed. And of course, God started using that very same prophet to encourage them. And, and so from chapter 40 onward, Isaiah is prophesying the, the really, instead of you're going to reap what you sow, he's prophesying, listen. Um, don't give up hope. And so listen to what Isaiah prophesies in chapter 40, verse 1. And this is the word of the Lord. And I, I, I'm, I'm telling you this, even prophetically today, I believe that God brought you to church this weekend to, to comfort you with these words. Isaiah 40, verse 1 says this, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. He's saying this to Isaiah. And proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. How many of you know there are years of hard service, so to speak? But guess what? They're temporary. I don't know what your life looks like right now. I don't know what your burdens feel like right now. But I can guarantee you this. They're temporary. And then skip to verse 9. God says, proclaim this message. Here is your God. You're wondering where he is? Well, here he is. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He's got good things. He's carrying good things. Verse 11, he tends his flock like a shepherd. That means he, he, he sometimes uses his rod and his staff. Um, he gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. I don't know about you, but man, that's a, that's a compassionate characterization of God, okay? I don't know how you perceive God today, but this is how God wants you to see him. He wants you to see him as a good shepherd who's carrying you close to his heart. That he's gently leading you, okay? You may not feel that. You may not see God as that. But guess what? You need to reconcile those emotions with the truths of God's word. And that's why God gave us this characterization of himself in his, in his word. And then he reminds us that not only is he compassionate, but this compassionate God is also huge. Verse 12. Who has measured the waters, the oceans, and the small part, the hollow of his hand, or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the huge mountains on the scales of the hills in a balance? Listen, when, you're, when your friend is the king of the universe, you don't have to worry as much. How many of you realize that? You just don't have to worry. I mean, this hand, his hand spans the universe. Come on. This is, this is not only the good shepherd, but this is the all-powerful God who created the universe. And then skip down to verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a mere canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. Come on, what political power can hinder the power of our God? What boss can somehow obscure you? Really, what can mere man do to me? Nothing, the Bible says. No sooner, verse 24, no sooner are the kingdoms of the earth planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner did they take root in the, in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. A whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. And then God starts speaking in first person, verse 25. To whom will you compare me? And, and, and who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? Who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name? 
the starry host. I mean, you just think about the stars in the sky. I was just looking at the stars last night. It was such a clear night. And, and, and God calls each one of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. Uh, you, you, uh, even as I was looking at the stars, I kept thinking about how many stars are, are even beyond my eyesight. Get this. Did you know that if you took a dime and you held it at arm's length, okay, it, it, that, that dime would be covering over 15 million stars from your view at minimum, okay? Just that tiny little spot in the sky. You can't even see them all. But literally, there's that many stars. You're, it's blocking 15 million stars from view. I mean, and God it calls them each by name and yet managing that vast creation. For God, it's like overseeing a couple rocks. It's nothing if you understand just how big God truly is. And then in light of all of this, Isaiah asks the critical question, verse 27, so so, in light of all this, in light of who God is, in light of the, him being the good shepherd, in light of him being the mighty God who created everything, in light of all this, verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, O people of God, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Why do you say that? Do you not know, verse 28, have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He won't grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. I mean, how do we think ever that God doesn't see our trials? I mean, come on, with this type of God, why do we pretend that he doesn't understand? It's almost ridiculous to think that any of us are alone in our difficulty, and yet this huge powerful God is on our side. How amazing is that? You know, I, I, I think at some point in our lives, we all have to deal with this problem of evil, of, of, of if, if God is loving and if God is all, all powerful, then why is he not resolving my circumstances the way I want in the timeline that we want it? And listen, God does instantaneously remove evil from our lives on occasion. I, I believe that God does miracles. I've seen so many miracles over the years. I've seen undeniable miracles where, where God just moved and all of a sudden it just changed everything. I, uh, where, where I've just prayed, God, why are my finances the way they are? And then all of a sudden, boom, I just discover money. Come on, isn't that a great day? I'm just saying, I believe that God sometimes instantaneously resolves our circumstances and other times he tells us to get a budget. I believe that sometimes God is developing something deeper in our lives or sometimes God is ingeniously thwarting evil by doing a greater good in our lives and all we have to do is stay strapped into that roller coaster, don't opt out in the middle of it and then all of a sudden by the time it comes to a screeching halt, we're like, it's done, it's changed, it's better. Everything all of a sudden in our lives is resolved. You see, sometimes God instantaneously removes evil but the Bible also says sometimes he ingeniously thwarts it. And really, it's not us to choose. It's God's choice over our lives. All we can do is choose to trust God in the midst of that roller coaster. But let's be honest, for some of us, it's easier than others. And, and, and for all of us, I think we've got certain areas of our lives where it's easy to trust God and other areas where we're weak of faith. And come on, I, I think we see weakness of faith in other people, but when it comes to us, you know what I'm saying? a little harder. And I, I just, you know, there, there's times in our lives where I really believe that we just want simple and it's okay to want simple. It's okay to just to say, God, would you just come down into my life and just kind of, you know, take care of the devil? I think that's why I love to watch action movies. I think I like the brainless action movies where the bad guy just gets their, their behind or whooped. Okay. That's a technical term. I just, it even says, hey, in the Bible, it even says that God kicks butt. It says he smote them in their hinder parts. It actually says that, okay? That's King James for butt whooping, okay? The Bible says that this is a butt whooping God, and I believe that he loves to do this. I remember, I remember like before I became a pastor, I used to love those like super artsy movies that had like disturbing endings, and I'd be like, mm, that's so thought provoking, you know what I'm saying, in my elitist sort of way. And then once I became a pastor, you know what? I was like, I was done with complicated. Those are the 
the last movies I wanted to, to rent because, you know, my life was complicated. I had a front row seat to people's disasters every single Sunday. And when I came home from church, I wanted uncomplicated. I don't want complicated. I don't want thought-provoking. I don't want drama. I just want somebody to go Jason Bourne up in here. Come on, somebody. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. I just want it simple, right? I just want, I want Steven Seagal to pull his hair back in a slick, greasy pony table and tail and just start karate chopping. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to see Chuck Norris do roundhouse kicks and just take out 12 ninjas at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we just want to see Vin Diesel do a backflip in his Mustang convertible and then shoot with both hands. Okay, nobody wants to see that. Come on, people, seriously. <laughs> Cars cannot do backflips, that's stupid, okay? But you know what I'm saying? Sometimes, it's, it's like the TV show 24, you know, by the eighth season, whenever you're stressed out, you simply remind yourself, this is Jack Bauer, okay? He's gonna interrogate someone, he's gonna breathe heavily. <sighs> And he's going to kick terrorist butt. That's how it happens every single time. You don't have to worry about it. You just, all you have to do is sit back and watch the drama unfold. And you, 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 know, you want to know why we spend millions of dollars on brainless action movies? It's because we just want to be reminded that the good guys win. We just want to be reminded that sometimes, though the odds are stacked against us, somehow, against all odds, things are just going to go in favor of the good person. You know what I'm saying? We like it because we also know that the main character generally isn't going to die. And so instead of asking, will they survive, we're asking a different question. It's this, how are they going to kick butt this time? You know what I'm saying? It changes your orientation. It goes from a posture of, oh no, what's going to happen to, oh no, how is it going to absolutely slay this dude? I just want to see it. I want to hear the one line. What's going to be the one liner that he's going to say right before? What is he going to, you know, like, what is the Terminator going to say? I'll be back. You know, like, what is he going to say? Go ahead, make my day. You know what I'm saying? Like some one liner. I just want to hear a one liner. You know what I'm saying? You, you want to, you're thriving off of that. That's why we spend money on this kind of, kind of stuff. And I, I really feel like God is trying to communicate a similar message in Isaiah 40. Instead of asking the question, will God help? Does God see me? Is my, does, is my cause disregarded? God is saying, stop asking that question. It just gets old, especially when you're God. You're like, oh my gosh, how many times are, are, are humans going to ask the same type of question? God's like, listen, I'm going to demonstrate my power in your life, but what I need you to do is trust me to work a greater good and stop thinking you know what that is. I believe that God would say to us many, many times when we're praying our little prayers, our little formulaic prayers with our little arbitrary timelines, God's saying, would you trust me to bless you? I know you better than you know you. I know what would bless you better than you know what would bless you. You just don't even know yourself yet. Some of us, we don't even know what we should be praying. We don't even know what timelines we should be trusting for. At some point, it really just comes down to one basic thing, and it's faith. Will we put our faith in God or not? Will we trust that God's got our backs or not? And, and what, what changes when we make that decision is that all of a sudden we start walking with a swagger, not because we're so awesome, but because the God we serve is so awesome. And guess what? The same God that we serve, the same God that speaks and universes occur, that same God is the good shepherd who carries us close to his heart. That's why we think differently than the rest of the world. Your plot line might be a little bit dramatic today, but listen, you know that you know that you know God causes all things to work together for good for those that love him that are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. And, and, and you don't need to get too stressed because listen to what this God does. Isaiah 40, we're gonna continue in verse 29. This is God's promise to you. And some of you, you need to hear this. God promises this, verse 29. God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. I believe this speaks both to us physically and emotionally. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Some of you, you need to memorize that this week. Verse 30, even youths go tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk 
and not be faint. Come on, church. I just believe that there's a few of you out there today who are, you're, you're kind of like me back when I was living in Wisconsin. Uh, you're feeling hopeless. You've got certain dreams that just, man, they just, they could not feel like they're further out. They, a finish line that just feels like forever away and it's starting to mess with your idea of God and yet God's saying, oh, you don't, you don't understand me yet. You don't understand me yet. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to lie to you as, as your pastor and say, hey, listen, God did everything I wanted in the timeline that I wanted it. But I can say this. Looking back, God's timing was perfect. And everything in my life happened first slowly, then suddenly. First slowly, then suddenly. And if we could just get used to that pattern, if we could just get accustomed to God being slow than sudden, slow than sudden, all of a sudden, we're not gonna, we're not gonna worry the same way we, you know, we, that, that, that non-Christians worry. Again, the Bible says that only fatherless pagans are constantly worrying about their needs, running after their needs, Matthew 6. But listen, God knows what you need before you ask, Matthew 6, 8, and will provide all you need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 19. And so what I want to do today is, is, is I want to end with a simple come to Jesus moment because there is an end date. There is a time where God is going to fulfill the plans that he's got for you. And yet that, that drama, it can take a little while. I was even just uh, hanging out with the worship band before, uh, the, 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 before church started today. And I was just thinking uh, about all the different miracles that God has done in our church recently. Almost every single week, God does a miracle in our church. Even just, uh, just, just recently, even my wife and I were just talking and, and um, uh, actually our, so our, our exec pastor here at the church, Nate Puccini, was having a really hard time selling his house. And of course, especially in a market where it, it just feels like everything is, is selling really fast, it was just not selling. And, and of course, it was, you know, offers that were just falling through and it was frustrating. And of course, you know, uh, my wife was just praying, you know, like she just, my wife is very prophetic, just like my, uh, my daughters. And she just asked God, God, when are you going to sell, when are you going to sell Pastor Nate's house? Like, when is it going to happen? And she was just like really listening for the Spirit of God. And she sensed that the Holy Spirit just spoke to her, um, hey, it's going to sell by Memorial Day weekend. And uh, just very specific. It was very, very, sp she just knew that this was the Lord. And, and so for, for those of you who are like, what do you mean? Like God just speaks? Well, um, over the years, you're going to get good at hearing the voice of God. I, I do believe that sometimes you're like, well, what does that sound like? It's not like an audible voice, but sometimes it's just like a really strong impression. Well, how do you know the difference between your, your own impressions, your own overactive imagination and God's thoughts? Well, sometimes you don't. Sometimes that's why we judge all impressions according with God's scripture so that we don't get cultic and, and sometimes we're wrong. But over the years, those impressions start becoming stronger. And the more that you know God's will and the more that you know God's character, all of a sudden you, you, God's, God starts speaking in very, very specific ways. And of course, you know, uh, my wife has learned how to discern the, the, the voice of God. And so Carolyn had shared that. She's like, I, and she just, decided, hey, I'm going to step out on a limb and I'm going to tell Pastor Nate, hey, your house is going to sell by this weekend. Yeah, that's, I just know because God spoke that to me. And, and she just said that as an act of encouragement uh, to Pastor Nate. And of course, you know, sure enough, boom, it just sold. It just sold. And I, 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 love, how, I love how God could be that specific with my wife and, and, I, and in our, our church, we've heard numerous stories. I was even sharing with the worship band. Uh, I, I, as we were praying, one of our, our, our staff members, Kelly Draz, they were trusting God for, to adopt. And of course, it just felt like this never-ending process of adoption. And then somebody you know, got a prophetic word, hey, um, you're literally going to get a call during the release of our I.O. album. And of course, like, it's, it was very specific. And sure enough, uh, right as we were releasing the album, they got a call, hey, <laughs> you have a son. It's a happy birthday, you know? It was kind of like that kind of situation. And I, it was like out of nowhere. They'd been waiting forever. I mean, it was like, and it, it just as like the word of the Lord had spoken to them. And, and in this passage, you have to understand they're in captivity in Babylon. And then there's prophecies about how God is going to restore them. And they're like, oh, but, but our, my way is hidden. My cause is disregarded. And Isaiah was saying, no. You just don't understand God yet. You don't understand God. And, and listen, I've seen God do this kind of stuff. And I've seen God speak to people about the timelines. But then there's other things in my life where it was like, God, when is this going to happen? 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 
For years and years and years, I would just sit in my, my basement recording studio and I, and I would write worship songs to God. I would just be weeping. And then I'd be like, God, at what point is, is somebody going to hear one of these songs? And God was like, just wait. And yet, you know, and then, you know it, it, would, it would compound the issue when all of a sudden I'd hear all these really lame worship songs that'd be on these albums and then people, and then for some weird reason, churches would love them and they'd be like dorky worship songs. Come on, have you ever heard a dorky worship song where you're like, why does any church do that song? And yet, you know, you'd be like, how in the world does this happen? And then, and then you know, I'd be sitting there faithfully in my studio thinking, I, I, like, why is it never happening for me? And of course, when things are not happening for you, it always seems like you you notice who it's happening for. You know what I'm saying? You're trying to get pregnant and then Fertile Myrtle is just machine gunning babies out. You know what I'm saying? And, and you're, you're, you're trusting God for a raise and then your friend who could not be more of a dork is just like, I don't know why they just keep giving me more money. It's awesome. And you're like, why not for me, God? It's so hard in those moments to say, God, I trust you. And yet that's a decision all of us have to make at some point in our lives. And so today I just want to end with a simple come to Jesus moment, especially as we're taking communion. There's just a bunch of you who are listening to this message today and you believe in God and yet because things have not been happening in your timeline, you've simultaneously quit on God. You believe in God, yet you've quit on God. And you know who you are. You, you believe in God's power, but you just don't believe he would use it for you. It's like this weird contradiction, and yet I believe God's word to you, he would say right back to you, Isaiah 40, 26, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. But you're saying, yeah, I have looked at the heavens. Well, you stopped. I believe that there is a discipline of just meditating on God's word. Faith comes by hearing God's word. And some of you, I, I just wanted to read a chapter of God's word today because I wanted to stimulate your faith. And that's why, that's why we commit to the discipline of church attendance because church is the only institution on planet earth that's truly committed to the proclamation of God's word. And I just, you know, sometimes all we have to do is just expose our souls to God's word and boom, faith starts rising up in our hearts, hopes are it's rising up in our heart. And then as a result, uh, we can continue. We can stay faithful. And yet how many people have quit right before God came through? How many people have quit before God came through? And it's always so sad. It's always so sad. I think about that, that one uh, Olympic speed skater who, uh, you know, they're trying to win the gold. And of course, you know, when, when things were starting to pan out the way that everything was working, uh, there's no way it's even statistically possible for them uh, to, to really win the gold unless they come in first place. And of course, already right out of the gate, all the speed skaters are going around the circles and, and this person is already getting way far behind. But then uh, again, the, the odds of, of just make, call it, luck, call it blessing, call it whatever you want, but all of a sudden, um, one of the top speed skaters wiped out, and then all of a sudden, the next speed skater wiped out and took out the other person, and all this person had to do now is just finish the race, and they could win gold medal. You know what I'm saying? Come on. It was like, it was like against all odds, all they had to do is not fall down. All they had to do is keep skating. All they had to do is not quit, and I wonder how many of us we're in that state where we're just, we're quitting on God. We're, we're abandoning his standards. We're abandoning hope. We're abandoning his word right before God's enabling us to win gold. And I, I just want to encourage you as you're taking communion today, just to take whatever little bit of faith you got, even if it's a tiny little bit, uh, even a mustard seed of faith, and just put it back into the hands of God and just watch what he does. And maybe, maybe you're here today and you're like, gosh, I don't even know if I've ever even given my life to Christ, or maybe you have, but you just know it's time for a reset. Either way, if that's you today, if you want to give your life to Christ, maybe even for the first time, what we're going to do is the moment I start praying, I want you just to take out your phone and I want you just to text the word. Where you're going to see the number up on the screen. I, I just want you to text a simple little word to the number 31996, okay? So just text the word next step 
to 31996. And, and we're just going to send you a little follow-up form so we can pray for you. You don't even have to respond to it. But once again, just if you want to give your life to Christ or press that reset button, text the word next step to 31996 as an act of faith. And yet for the rest of you, right after I pray, um, the campus pastors are going to come on up and, and facilitate communion. And as we take it today, remember, you're covenanting with a God who offers us everything, the least we could do as we're taking communion and entering into that contract is just trust that his plan and his grace is sufficient for us. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for dying on a cross for us. We thank you for giving, shedding your blood and giving your body on our behalf that we might have life, Lord, that we might purchase the full measure of what you possess, Lord, that we would have access to your unlimited favor, strength, power, and blessing. And so, Heavenly Father, as we covenant today with you, we just trust you that, that miracles are going to take place, Lord, that healings are going to happen in our physical bodies, that you're going to work miracles that we didn't even know were possible today. Why? Because that's who you are. You're a good Father and that you love us so deeply. And so today, we trust you in Jesus' name. And if you agree with that prayer, say amen. Amen. With all that said, we're going to have the campus pastors come on, us up, come on up here and tell us where we're going to go next. I love you guys. We'll see you next weekend.